My name is Adam Weewell. I'm a senior chemical engineer at the University of Toledo, minoring in renewable energy. Um, our project is design, installation, operation of a PV array atmospheric conditions monitoring station. And Rowan Martin is just a team who's helping along the project. And Randy Ellenson is our advisor. This is the PV array that's in front of the R1 building. It was installed in 2006. Each uh, panel is for solar cadmium telluride. They're about 8% efficiency. <coughs> and there's two arrays. Each one is 6 kilowatts. And one of them has an inverter. So we're, con uh, we're converting the DC to AC power so it can be connected to the grid. And the other one has straight DC, which at once was used for electrolysis to make hydrogen gas for, I think, fuel cell research. I think I um, for solar, cadmium telluride, uh, solar panels for silicon multicrystalline. All solar panels decrease in efficiency as temperature increases. Uh, for solar, cadmium telluride solar panels according to tests that they have conducted, decrease at a lesser rate compared to multi-crystalline silicon. And as you can see, uh, there's trend lines. This is the for cadmium telluride. And based on the equation, you can see that 0.2% efficiency, efficiency is decreased per degrees uh, Celsius compared to multi-crystalline, which is 0.48% decrease per degree Celsius. So it decreases about 2.5 times less. So in extreme hot temperatures, or I guess it's not really that extreme, but in hot environments, the cadmium telluride solar panels are more efficient. And so our project is to set up a monitoring station where we monitor irradiance, ambient temperature, and the module temperature. And we'll take this data and correlate with the power output. Um, to measure irradiance, we're using a pyranometer, this picture right here, which measures uh, the light at nanometers uh, 300 to 2800 nanometers. And um, we're measuring this because of this equation, this power output equation, where I is the irradiance. A is the area, and eta is the efficiency. Area does not change unless you add solar panels onto your array. And efficiency does not change when there's constant um, illumination, I guess standard. And so you can pretty much correlate power to directly to irradiance. And then we're measuring the module temperatures, as you've seen in the previous slide, because we want to know how the module temperature changes to actually see if uh, our panels are different from the model test results. So we can correlate if it changes a degree. My name is Adam Weewell. I'm a senior chemical engineer at the University of Toledo, minoring in renewable energy. Um, our project is design, installation, operation of a PV array atmospheric conditions monitoring station. And Rowan Martin Haven is just a team who's helping along the project. And Randy Ellenson is our advisor. This is the PV array that's in front of the R1 building. It was installed in 2006. Each uh, panel is for solar cadmium telluride. They're about 8% efficiency. <coughs> and there's two arrays. Each one is 6 kilowatts. And one of them has an inverter. So we're, con uh, we're converting the DC to AC power so it can be connected to the grid. And the other one has straight DC, which at once was used for electrolysis to make hydrogen gas for, I think, fuel cell research. I think
Um, first solar came in paleoid. Uh, solar panels for silicon multicrystalline. All solar panels decrease in efficiency as temperature increases. Uh, first solar is cadmium telluride solar panels, according to tests that they have conducted, decrease at a lesser rate compared to multicrystalline silicon. And as you can see, uh, there's trend lines. This is the for cadmium telluride. And based on the equation, you see that 0.2 efficiency. 0.2% efficiency is decreased per degrees uh, Celsius compared to multicrystalline, which is 0.48% decrease per degree Celsius. So it decreases about 2.5 times less. So in extreme hot temperatures, or I guess it's not really that extreme, but in hot environments, the chemical telluride solar panels are more efficient. And so our project is to set up a monitoring station where we monitor irradiance, ambient temperature, and the module temperature. And we'll take this data and correlate with the power output. Um, to measure irradiance, we're using a pyranometer, this picture right here, which measures uh, the light at nanometers uh, 300 to 2800 nanometers. And um, we're measuring this because of this equation, this power equation, where I is the radiance, A is the area, and eta is the efficiency. Area does not change unless you add solar panels onto your array. And efficiency does not change when there's constant um, illumination, I guess standard. And so, you can pretty much correlate power to directly to irradiance. And then we're measuring the module temperatures, as you've seen in the previous slide, because we want to know how the module temperature changes to actually see if uh, our panels are different from the model test results. So we can correlate if it changes a degree C, does it drop in a certain amount of efficiency with the power. And ambient temperature we're measuring because um, you can have constant irradiance, and yet you can have a zero degree day and a seven degree day, and the panel temperatures will be different. So that also correlates into um, to uh, I guess measure these sensors and to collect the data. We are using National Instruments DAC or Data Acquisition Unit. And the software we're using that is called LabVIEW. And so we are making uh, programs right now in order to capture that data, process the data, and save the data. And this is an example of one of our LabVIEW programs. And our ultimate goal is to get this to the public. Um, here's an example of the McMaster array, as some of you probably seen the solar panel up front. Uh, I guess of this direction. Um, this is uh, a snapshot from it, but I wanted to show you, this is the link <coughs> to this array. And so this is actually real-time data of the array up front. So right now, <coughs> it's showing that it's made about almost 100 watts from noon to one, which Obviously, it's not done yet, so it'll just keep going. And five minutes, you can refresh in this new date. And that's our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Adam? I think I missed the, that there are two arrays. One, one's hooked up to an inverter, and one is a DC array. Yes. Um, and was it was it the DC array that you're doing this monitoring of? I, I no, we're monitoring on the one that has the inverter oh, okay. because we want to know the actual power output so that way we can, um, I guess it's more impactful for anyone who wants to use the data because then either companies or residential can use the data to help monitor their own systems so that way they can, say they have like a six kilowatt array, array they can, based on the weather data of that day, predict what they might actually get that day. So it helps more accurate data.
Okay. In the chamber you're creating, so you're, you're measuring the ambient temperature, module temperature, and the irradiance. Um, are you, is this currently uh, an enclosed chamber that the air is stagnant? And are you also planning on maybe introducing a wind speed effectively, some kind of convection in there that you can measure the effect of that in transfer as well? Um, as of now, we're planning on putting it like right next to actually the ray, so it will not be in like enclosed area. But the temperature sensor for the ambient air, we're planning on encapsulating it so that way um, snow, rain, wind does not affect it, so it's actually the technically stagnant air of the actual temperature. For the ambient temperature? Yeah. But uh, for the module temperature, so if you're going to install it outside, do you have any plans on installing like a wind speed monitor or just using maybe data from a weather center nearby? As of now, we're not planning on implementing a wind speed one. It might be something that could be added on to this project later on. Like after we've done this, someone can add on one because that would probably help correlate it better. But yeah, as you said, we could potentially see just the average wind speed of the area and use that. So you can get rid of, I guess, extreme wind days, because you know it's going to vary a little bit.